Good morning. Morning, morning. Yeah. It is great to see all of you smiling faces this morning. Welcome to chapel. My name is Mike. I'm the campus pastor here. I want to welcome you. We have a really uh, fun um, chapel this morning. I'm excited because we're going to be having, you're going to be hearing from um, some staff that you get to see on campus today, uh, every day, but um, maybe you don't always get to hear them in this chapel space. So it's going to be a really uh, neat chapel this morning. A few things before we get started. I'm going to invite Miranda Shackelford up to share about an opportunity that's coming up here in a few days. Give it up for Miranda. Show of hands, anybody ever read or watch the movie A Wrinkle in Time? All right, yeah. So the author, Madeline the Engel, has written a lot of different poetry that's inspired uh, by scripture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a right night at my house next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And we're going to do some practices of reading scripture together and then seeing what kind of short stories or poetry inspires is inspired by that and write together and in fellowship and uh, I have dogs so if you have a dog allergy let me know and we can move it outside and uh, yeah so if you want to register I'll send you my address and we'll we'll have a great night awesome thanks Miranda all right why don't we stand shake hands with someone next to you welcome them let's prepare our hearts to worship this morning Good morning, everybody. Welcome to chapel. Would you pray with me before we enter into worship? God, I just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and your throne and to worship you. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to do so with a, an incredible community of believers of all different ages. And I just pray that you just bless this time of worship, help us to focus our hearts and our minds towards you and our worship and help it to all be for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. 
Lord, we come to you today, and we're just so thankful that we get to meet for worship, for chapel, and Lord, just I pray that you give wisdom to our uh, faculty today that are going to be talking to us. Um, Lord, just thank you for a great worship, and God, I just hope that going to the end of the semester here that um, just you just help us push through it, God, and just um, do it all for you. pray this in your name. Amen. All right, all right. We're going to do a quick stage change. Go ahead and come on up, panelists. Uh, would you welcome our five staff who will be sharing with us this morning? Come on up. So we've had this on the, the schedule for a while. I'm really excited. Uh, we have five staff members here who will be sharing in the topic we have picked out is Christian leadership. And um, all of these people are in a position of leadership here at Friends and are Christians. So works out uh, to be able to share about that. So we're going to get this set up here. Let's see, we've got our chairs. We've got one more coming. I think you guys are good. All right. And then everyone needs... Oh, you guys are, you know, snuggled up on the small couch. That's great. All right. It's, it's totally your call. It's totally, I'll take that one. How about that? All right. Um, so first, can you go, uh, everyone take a minute and just share who you are, what you do on, on campus, and uh, yeah, a little bit about yourself, starting with I'll Terry. Start. Hello, you were there. On? Yeah, I'll start. I'm Terry Harris. I'm the head football coach here. Morning, guys. No, it's great. That was awesome. Give it up for Terry. All right. Flip it over. There you go. Now can you hear me? Yep, yep, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Oren Breckenridge. I'm the career services manager here at Friends. And uh, I'm the oldest of four boys. Well, they're all men now. But, um, yeah, also born and raised here in Wichita. There we go. Give it up for Warren. Uh, I'm Suzanne Unruh, the head softball coach here. I'm going on my sixth year here at Friends. Um, I've been coaching for 22 years in college, so I've um, been doing it a while. But I'm from here, from Derby. Go Panthers. And uh, that's me. Yeah. I'm Dean Jaderson, the women's basketball coach here. Uh, that's my wife, Julie, Mama Jay down there. And uh, my middle son is Mike, so it's a family thing. Thanks, Dad. Good morning. I'm Danita Mason, and I am AVP of People and Culture, um, a fancy way of saying human resources. And I'm also Title IX office. I hope I don't see any of y'all. <laughs> in there. I've been at Friends two years, April 1st, and um, if you talk to me, you will hear me talk about my favorite person in the world, Shawn Michael, my 15-year-old teenage son, teenager things going on over here, but that's my favorite person. All right, give it up to Nita. So the, how this work, I'll, I'll pose a question to you. Some of these uh, I had put together, and we've actually had a few sent in, too. So we'll see how many we get to. Um, I'll have someone start it off, but if anyone wants to chime in after with another thought, uh, we'll just keep this casual and have a discussion about Christian leadership. So we'll start off with an easy one. Terry, are you ready? Can't wait. How do you define success uh, as a I, Christian leader? I think, um, you know, for us, you know, we, I coach this silly game of football. I mean, ultimately, it's a kid's game, right? And some of you may really believe that, right? It is silly. Um, but whatever we choose to do, whether it's, you know, my guy playing the piano up here, which seems incredibly difficult to me and impressive, but um, if it's football, um, you have to redefine success in whatever you do. Um, and what we try to do as a leader um, is pursue a purpose uh, much, much higher than winning. Um, and so some of that takes a little bit of redefining success. And so for us, um, 
we want to be ambassadors uh, of Christ through football. And sometimes that, that sounds like two things that are diametrically opposed, but they're not. Uh, you can do both. Um, and so trying to outline ways as a leader of how can you honor God, which is what it ultimately boils down to, through sport. Um, and the reality is the Bible is very clear on that. Um, you know, things like self-denial, uh, trust, loyalty, accountability, all of those things are biblical principles that Jesus talked about and taught. And if we can do that through football, um, then we are successful. Having said that, you know, just no one says being a Christian means you can't be very competitive. Um, and if you're going to put Jesus' name on your program, then I think it calls you to be excellent. And there is an element of success. You have to be um, excellent. And so for us, there is an element of that that we do want to be very good. We do want to be a great ambassador um, for friends, for Christ, through, through our record as well. Right? We do want to be, have some influence, and some of that is related to the scoreboard a little bit. And so um, we try to do that every day, and that, that's incredibly dis- difficult, obviously. And you know, I certainly as a leader, I know I disappoint people at times, and, and just like you, know, you probably feel the same way. Um, but if, if you are pursuing a purpose much more than winning simply on a scoreboard, understanding you're an ambassador through, of, for Christ through sport, um, yeah, that's how we try to do it. And hopefully we're doing a good job of that here. And I think we're all call, called to do that um, as ambassadors of Friends University, no matter what you choose to do, whether it's football or anything else. Thanks, Terry. Let's go to the next one. Um, and this is a, I'd love to hear from several of you on this one. What is a story or a passage from Scripture that has impacted you as a leader, has helped form you as a leader, is a way that you've leaned into being a leader uh, and a Christian leader? And uh, Dean, I'll have you start. Yeah, it's hard to tell a sh- story quickly, so yeah. I'll do my best. There's a a story in the Old Testament, you've got a young man, he's the youngest in his family. His family's not well respected at all in the community. During this time, they're being dominated by these marauding bands of, of uh, Moabites who, whenever they would reap a harvest, they'd get the grapes or their wheat, they'd wait till it was all done and then they would just steal it. And so you find this young guy, he gets the worst job in the world, he's got to thresh the wheat. And normally you do it out in the open where the wind can catch the dust and the chaff and everything. You throw it up and the wind blows the light stuff away and the good stuff falls. But if you do it up in the open, then all the marauders come and they steal it when you're done. So he decides he digs a pit. And so he's in the pit. He's throwing the weed up. Well, the problem is there's no wind in a pit. So all the chaff and all the dirt and all the dust is falling down on him. And I have this picture of this young, kind of depressed frustrated kid. He's covered in wheat and chaff. It's hot. He's sweaty. And all of a sudden there's a guy on the edge of the pit who looks at him and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I think in that moment, that's the last thing he thinks he is. He thinks he's the youngest. He's the runt of the litter. His family doesn't matter. He's stuck in this pit with dust sticking to him. And I think he thinks the guy's probably sarcastic. He's probably one of those marauders who's going to steal his stuff. But he's not. He's an angel. And he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And and Gideon, the boy's name, says, wait wait a minute, I'm not. And the angel says, yes, you are. And through a series of miracles and a series of simply being obedient Gideon goes from being the least respected person out there to the leader of the nation who delivers his people from the Moabites. And there's a couple things for me as a leader that really stand out. One, it's not where you start, but where God takes you. And a lot of people don't step into leadership roles because they think they're not capable. And that's not, that's not the case at all. And many great leaders start in the worst places. I actually have a Uh, article in my notes I keep, it says the next Billy Graham could be lying drunk in a ditch right now. It's not where you start. But the second thing, it was all about obedience. Each step of the way, Gideon didn't know where he was going to go, but when he was obedient, God acted. And when he was doubting, God acted. And when he was obedient, God acted. And so for me as a leader, whenever I'm faced with a challenge, 
The first thing is not the situation. The first thing is obedience. And if I do that, God's faithful in the process. That's great. I was going to say um, the scripture, Matthew 25 and 40, um, verily I say unto you, and as much as you have done unto the least of these, you have also done unto me. The scripture after that says what? Depart from me. So in human resources, we have to deliver some of the most negative, ickiest news. Dealing with students in Title IX, it's not easy, those conversations. However, my faith walk and my faith journey and my um, desire to be in right standing with God means that I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect when you come to me because I can't turn it off. I, I can't be on at church and not, at, not on at work. I might have one good one. The one that comes to me is my girl, Esther. Um, I think sometimes when we're coaching girls, and especially in college, and sometimes they might not see the purpose of why they're here, or, you know, what is my role right now? And um, I think we, we struggle with that a little bit. And there's been a few times um, here recently we've talked about Esther as a leader. And I mean, I always describe her as a super pretty lady, like a softball player. And she doesn't know her purpose yet, but it's coming. And I give them the verse. Um, perhaps this is the moment for which you were created. And just let them know, like, um, you know, you're here for a reason. And it might not be tomorrow. It might not be the starting pitcher role. It might not be this. But God has created you to be this beautiful, brave, courageous woman out there. And um, I just always use Esther. She's my girl. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I'll be very quick, as brief as you can, about uh, the uh, the parable of the prodigal son. But that that I can that really resonates with me, um, and I think working with young people in the age that you're in, I can I can certainly relate to that. And essentially, for those unfamiliar, completely, the prodigal means essentially wasteful. Um, and so the son leaves home, receives an inheritance early, and totally screws it up. Um, and, you know, and then obviously he's scared to go back home, but when he goes back home, is welcomed back by his father's open arms. And thank goodness that, um, you know, for you guys and certainly for me um, at your age, you know, you get your first opportunity at freedom, living on your own essentially. And a lot of times, you know, we all fall short and we all make mistakes. And I certainly um, was no different. But thank goodness that, you know, obviously Jesus is there and obviously will always welcome you back um, with open arms. So that, that's my favorite story in the Bible. I guess in terms of my faith walk, just to end this. <clears throat> my faith walk has uh, challenged me to really trust God uh, with everything and not to, even if I have an understanding that I can handle some things in my life, I really have to be obedient and give things to God and trust him with my situations. So one verse that's really been with me for the last year has been, um, you know, to, to uh, you know, be anxious for nothing and to, with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, you know, giving those things to God. And um, <clears throat> that, that's changed my thinking because a lot of times in, in moments, not all the time, but in moments, you know, I'm, I'm faced with a challenge and, you know, worry might come about or a feeling of anxiety might start to boil. And I've recognized, like, when I have some of those moments to, okay, I need to quickly give that to God rather than let it fester. And that's changed the outcome of my response and how I handle a situation and really trusting God in my situation and walking me through a situation. So um, if there was any scripture, yeah, that's what's been helpful in my life. So That's great. So when we bring up the topic of leadership, you know, if you were to go to library and, and look that up and look for books and resources, there's endless amounts of material about leadership. But there's something fundamentally different about Christian leadership versus, say, just secular leadership. There, there are unique differences. And so I'd love for us to talk about, and Suzanne, why don't you start us off? What, how would you see, um, what, what, what is a difference? What is, what is unique about being a Christian leader uh, versus a, perhaps, a secular leader? Um, probably just the focus and the why for me, um, kind of being led to lead and, and um, you know, I think the focus of our actions by serving others, um, loving others, 
um, being selfless, having grace, I think that's a big one for coaching, and um, humility. Um, those are just ways that we can bring honor to God. Um, I'd also thought that it gives you kind of a stable foundation and um, really helps me make big decisions because um, it can kind of be a compass for that and you can kind of always lead um, by what God would do. You know, what would Jesus do? That's a big thing. Um, <laughs> And maybe in a secular leadership role, maybe it's more um, like goal oriented, maybe more crunching the numbers, the bottom line, um, promotions, things like that. And there's nothing really wrong with that, but um, but to be able to like walk with God in your leadership and glorify him in that, I just think there, that's a no brainer for me. I just think that's the better way to lead, so. Oh. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah, so my career was started in corporate America. So this is my first opportunity to work for an institution, an organization that says this is who we are, we are Christian. Now have I worked for organizations that say they are? Yes, they, I have. Um, however, um, it, it's what's not there like Sue says, there's, the grace is not there. It's, it's not always there. The slow to anger is not always there. Sometimes it's not always here, if I'm, if I'm being honest. But then again, you have to let God do his work in some people and, and, and let, them, let him do his work, let the Holy Spirit do his work in some people because everybody is on their individual walk with God right now. And so you, you have to say that, but secular or here, you're still dealing with people. And you're still dealing with people at different phases in their walk with Christ. And you have to remember that. And you have to, um, as a Christian leader, you do have to leave space for grace. And you do have to leave space for forgiveness and humility and the ability to be corrected when you need it. When Mike gave us his question, there were a couple thoughts as I thought this through. The first thing for me and the difference between um, Christian and secular leadership. In secular leadership, you're the boss. In Christian leadership, you're the lieutenant. Or you, you still have somebody above you who eventually works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so trusting that um, trusting that there's something else happening besides, Sue said, it's, you know, it's not just crunching the numbers, but there's something more at work, it's somebody's life, it's somebody's family, it's somebody's future role, and you don't know, and you are trusting God. Sometimes we're just preparing good soil, sometimes we do get to see a seed grow, but we don't know, but since we're not in charge, we can rest in that. Um, and so that's, that's a perspective for me that I think is really, really important. Um, the second thing in that is uh, in leadership, it's your skills and your abilities and your training in, in secular leadership. In Christian leadership, it's your skills and your abilities and your training and your giftedness. That there's a role of the Holy Spirit um, when you are a Christian leader that you have to trust. Hudson Taylor said, you can change the heart of a man simply by praying for him and having no other interaction with him. And there are times you pray about a situation because you don't know what to do and God changes the heart of somebody. Um, you don't know how it's going to work out, but you're obedient. And God, through your giftedness and the Holy Spirit working through you, does things you never thought or an inspiration will come and an idea will come. And I don't think that happens in a purely secular sense, that the role of the Holy Spirit changes it and changes how we interact with people, and, and so we can trust and rest in that. That's good. Can you repeat the question again? Yeah. Um, in what ways does Christian leadership differ from secular leadership? I don't have a whole lot to add because similar to Danita's response, I also came from corporate America. Um, and part of my work experience helped pay for my undergraduate degree. I can for sure work alongside her or just agree with her that, yeah, it's very different in a secular workplace. Um, the good thing, outside of friends, there are employers that have 
a culture for uh, Jesus as, as part of their culture. Um, there's a few companies that we partner with that I know it's built into their, either their vision or their values or their friends alumni there that create that space. So I want to encourage you all that while <clears throat> from a success, from like a salary perspective, like that's, that's great. You want to land a job that's ultimately going to help support the lifestyle you, you're looking for. But I think culture, culture fit should be your number one thing you should be looking for as well as does the job align with what I'm looking for. Um, throughout my walk with Christ, as I gave my life to him back in 2018, um, I noticed my own life started to change in very small ways in the places that I worked. And I was actually seeking for other believers in my workplace because I wanted a connection to somebody. Who can I talk to about Jesus? You know, not who can I just talk to about life? So, and from a secular perspective. Um, but like Danita, this is the first place that I've worked at. And I've also got my master's from, thank God where this is a place where I can safely talk about my faith. So, and that I love to talk about my faith um, and grow with others in their walk with, with Christ too. So, I, I, I might add one thing. Sorry, you can, it might be, might be quick. You go first. I would say, we, I think uh, sometimes as a Christian leader, um, a lot of people, uh, and I, I would think people in a secular community would equate that with softness, and I think we have to be very careful. Um, calling yourself a Christian leader does not mean you have to be trampled on. It does not mean um, that you have to get run over. Um, I think you have to be very careful with that. I mean, there's obviously a plate forgiveness and grace, and all of those things truly matter, and we've seen that through Jesus. But I would say um, being a Christian leader, leader, I think, is much more difficult um, because you're seen, you do get... You're, you're, you're putting Jesus' name on your program product yourself. Um, so you do get held to that standard. Um, but in my, in, in my estimation, it calls for even greater accountability um, rather than what some people see as this second, third, fourth, fifth chances. I think, um, I think it is, I think it's required, or I think as a Christian leader, sometimes you have to hold people extremely accountable and not, um, and not be trampled on and walked over. And I think, I know as me, as a young, uh, as a young coach, certainly struggle with that. What does that even look like? Um, but I would encourage anyone in a, in a leadership role here as you go into that, it does not mean that you don't have extremely high standards. I think your standards have to be higher, and I think your accountability has to be even um, tougher than someone who would be um, you know, secular leader. I, I think every one of us, I know Terry, you were at a public high school. I was at a public high school. Everybody you coached at junior college. We've all been in both quote unquote secular and Christian environments. Um, I get nervous sometimes about making a separation. A couple things I know to be true. It doesn't matter where you are at. Many of you, especially students, are going to be in the secular world. One, you can always speak truth doesn't matter where you're at, truth is truth, and you can speak truth. Uh, when I was, uh, I was in, in uh, teaching or coaching, you can quote a Bible verse and not give a reference because it's truth. And, and, and there's a lot of wisdom that you can share with people. Um, and so truth is truth. You can always speak truth, and you can always speak to your own experience. You are allowed to tell your story wherever you're at. And so I, I don't want people to have this thing that you got to be different in one place than the other. Um, we're to be salt and light wherever we're at. And if you're at a place that's a faith-based institution like Friends, I guarantee you, you bump into a lot of people who are not believers, you are to be salt and light here. And if you're in corporate America, you're to be salt and light. And if you're at a high school, you're to be salt and light. That's what we're called to do. And you can speak boldly and you can speak truth and that's good and that's okay. I um, had this uh, CFO one time. I was in a meeting with a CFO and my leader. Um, this was several years ago. And um, it was, it, I knew it was going to be an uncomfortable conversation, but I'm okay with those. Um, and uh, he says, he stops for a moment. And he says, I'm going to use a word. I, I want to make sure that that's okay with you. He, he's looking at me and he's talking to me. And my, my senior, my senior leader is over here and I was like, okay. And he drops the F-bomb and the conversation. In the periphery of my eye, I could see her welling up in tears. And then I thought to myself, I said, okay, he stopped to ask me how I felt about him using that word in front of me. 
And what that said to me was that I absolutely walked my walk and talked my talk in truth at that place. And then I said to him, oh, I've heard that word before. <laughs> but I, I, it, it just kind of goes back to what Dean is saying, and I feel like what everyone else is saying here is like, who you are is who you are everywhere you go. There are people that I've had to terminate, and I've seen them in the Dillons. I've seen them in the parking lot of TJ Maxx, and I was not scared about what was gonna happen or take place. And for a couple of them, it was, you know what? Thank you for helping me move on. That's hard to believe, but when you are a person, when you are a believer and you are walking under the banner of love, which is what God grants to us, and you do that for other people, then the relationships are there, no matter how bad it is. Um. I think this leads well into this next question, especially as you think about being in some of these spaces where every day you're confronted with difficult scenarios, you're making ethical decisions, you're, you're, you're trying to make a difference. What, how do you stay healthy as a leader? So emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, in, in whatever position of leadership you're at. And we know of, all, I think we can all name leaders that have had some significant moral failures and struggle with, with many things. So, so, Orrin, I'll start with you, but what are some, and, and this is a big question, but maybe what's a practice or what's, what's something that you think about when it comes to just being healthy as a leader? I have to have a routine um, throughout my day. That's just where I thrive, <clears throat> especially in the morning for me and in the evening. Um, I, I carry my journal with me wherever I go. Like, this is like my best friend. Um, this is where I take time to jot my thoughts, where I'm taking, th taking time to jot my thoughts from my devotion, um, work notes, everything. Preston, my boss, has probably seen me carry this in the office every time. Uh, even if I'm jotting something down, like this is how I can keep myself grounded. This, is also, this also gives me a chance to reflect on my day. Uh, at the end of my day, I, I look and reflect what got done, what did not get done. Um, is there something on my mind that I was just thinking about throughout the entire day that I need to just get off my plate? Um, this is one tool that helps keep me grounded. Beyond that, um, it's gonna be community. Um, I, I was referred this book, so it probably doesn't help much that I don't have a ton of advice to share about it, but it's called uh, People Fuel by uh, Dr. John Townsend, I believe. So I'll be checking out that book, and it talks about how to pretty much surround yourself with people that are you know, adding fuel to your life, but you're also able to add fuel to their life, right? Um, again, I believe Dr. John Townsend uh, is also a man of faith, so I believe this is a uh, Christian book as well. Um, but those are the two things. I mean, it's journaling and community. Um, it's really that simple. Um, and I do enjoy some ice cream, so if you ever want to get me to do something really fast, Dr. Carey, you can definitely trick me with ice cream. So anyway. Anything to add to that? Turn off completely, turn off and don't apologize. Mm. You absolutely need the quiet time. Your brain needs the quiet time. Your heart, your soul, it needs the quiet time. And I don't apologize for that. I'm sorry you could not reach me at 8.31 p.m. I'm already at peace. <laughs> you don't have to feel bad about wanting peace and having that space for you and whatever that looks like. And for me, sometimes that's, it's baking, it's cooking, it's in the garden, it's running away from the possums and the raccoons in the backyard and then laughing about it. It's, it's laughing, it's laughing because I grew up where you were so sanctified, you didn't tell jokes. You, it, you didn't tell jokes. I think I'm pretty funny. And I, is, and I enjoy laughing with my friends and my family and my peers. We have a good time, don't we, Rob? All right. I, uh, my, my wife, every morning, gets up, gets to her chair, has her Bible, her journal. She's really good. I'm awful at that routine. 
um, and all my life that routine actually has been a hard thing for me. So I, I would, my son's going to attest to that. Um, but early on, and I don't know how it happened, um, there's this uh, phrase, practicing the presence of God. There is this sense all day that God is with me. And there are not these formal prayers in this specific time, but there is this sense all day, and I stop a lot. I stop in my mind very quickly before a conversation, before a practice, in the middle of a practice. There is a sense that God is there, and this, there's this running conversation in my mind all day long. And so I can't define it, um, but for those of you who struggle having routine, I can tell you I've spent 58 years trying to find a routine, and I still can't. Um, <laughs> But as a specific practice, this has carried me through a lot. And, and so that might be another option for those of That's you good. who are as ADD as I am. <laughs> we got about one minute, and I did want to get to one that was um, turned in. So we'll, we'll just wrap up on this one. And this is, how do you respond when someone you lead or even a friend goes through a crisis of faith? So um, when I hear that, that sound, there's probably a story behind that. Right, and these are, we, we deal with real people and real stories. So, would anyone want to? I didn't give you any prep on this one, but take a stab at that. This just came up with us with a, a friend. Julie's actually met with uh, yesterday or the day before. I've been through one. I'm sure every one of my sons have been through one. It is a normal thing, and the first thing is to normalize it. If you're not, if you don't have it, it means you're not really thinking through the, thoroughly through what you believe, and so you normalize it first. It doesn't make them less than. It's normal. There's prophets in the Bible. There are example after example. It's a normal thing. On the second, you trust God, not your own abilities. The Holy Spirit will walk them through. God can communicate far more clearly than we can, and so we support, we encourage, we pray. Um, but we do not have to solve it. So I had a friend who um, grew up Baptist. Uh, I grew up Kojic. When I met her um, around 2001, 2002, living in Dallas, she was a devout Baptist. Um, at the last, what, 15 years, her language changed. She stopped going to church, but then her language changed, and she would never say God, and she wouldn't say she, wouldn't say she believed in anything. In the last six months, her language has changed again because my language has stayed consistent, that I believe in God. He is who he is to me. I have a testimony. I have a testimony. And I, and I won't deny that it was God who brought me through and brought my son through. And so I just, as long as my language doesn't change, I'm gonna, again, let God do his work in her. And I see the needle moving. She's moving back toward, well, there's something divine. Absolutely. There is something divine happening in your life. There is something precise and divine going on. And come on back. Wouldn't y'all love to hear Danita give a full chapel no. sermon sometime? Just saying. No. Thank you so much. Uh, Dean, could you just close us in a blessing? And I, I'll say this, I, I'm speaking on your behalf, but I, I know all of you would be okay with this. If there's something that struck you or you wanted to have a follow-up conversation, I know that they're very busy with everything that's on their plates, but they, these leaders would be glad to meet with you, to talk with you, and you can reach out via an email and, and set something up. I know that they would all appreciate that. So Dean, we want to close us. I'm horrible with routine, so a number of years ago, I wrote out some prayers. I have one for my wife, I have one for my sons, I have one for my team that I come back to. Um, I just pull passages of scripture, and so for today, I took one of those and adapted it. So would you please stand today and receive this blessing? God, in the name of Jesus, I bless each person here today. I pray for them that their love for each other will overflow more and more, and that they will keep on growing in their knowledge and understanding. Help them to understand what really matters so that they may live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns. Fill their lives with good things produced by Christ Jesus so that they will bring glory and praise to you. Show them your favor. 
Help them sense your presence in their lives in new ways each day. Let your hand be on them and keep them from harm. Amen.